mention is a masterpiece in Akhida. It's a booklet that has become a reference point for the creed of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, being that it consists of ayat and a hadith, explicit texts from the Quran and the Sunnah that indicate the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded from what he has affirmed for himself and what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has affirmed for him as well. So today's topic, after addressing the attributes of love for Allah, we're going to take the attributes of the pleasure of Allah. And the connection between the two is that the people of innovation have a tendency to mix between the two or to give both the same meaning and disregard one to another. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves at the same time, is pleased. So this attribute of pleasure is very crucial. One of the reasons why it's so crucial is that one of the definitions or the main one of the main objectives or the one of the main parts of ikhlas part of the meaning of ikhlas is to desire the pleasure of Allah. To desire the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ibtiqa marbati. And this is the believer. When he desires the pleasure of Allah, he's being referred to as being sincere. So the meaning of ikhlas, sincerity, is to desire the pleasure of Allah waddar karamati and to seek his blessed abode. Person, we're to ask you, what is the definition of sincerity, of ikhlas? Tell him to seek the pleasure of Allah and to seek his blessed abode. What is his blessed abode? His paradise that he has prepared for the good doers. And these two affairs, there's a difference between them, inshallah. We're going to clarify that once a person enters paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, the inhabitants of paradise, I will give you something more than what you already have been given. So they say, Oh our Lord, what else could you give us after you've granted us the entry of paradise and everything therein? He responds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the majestic, Uhillu alaykum ridwani fala ashatu alaykum abada. I will be pleased over you and I'll never become displeased. So this is the pleasure that is intended, that a person seeks his pleasure with all of his deeds, along with being those who are entered into the blessed abode of Allah. So this goal of the believer to seek the pleasure of Allah is the taste of iman. It's the taste of Iman. It starts with it by uttering it on his tongue. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said from Hadith Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, Zaka Zaka Ta'am al Iman man radiya billahi rabban. Barely he who is pleased with Allah and Islam as a religion and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet then he has tasted the sweetness of Iman. So to the foremost way to obtain the pleasure of Allah is to become familiar with Allah, with His beautiful names and attributes. So the only way a person could be pleased with Allah is by becoming familiar with Him. The more you learn about Allah, the more you're acquainted of what, how just He is and His retribution 
and how graceful he is and his rewards and his gifts that he grants and bestows upon the servants. So the scholars have said, Akbaru ni'mah ridwanullah. The greatest blessing that a person could be given is the pleasure of Allah. The pleasure of Allah. After Allah mentioning the people be entered into paradise, He says, Wa ridwanun min Allahi akbar. After mentioning that they will enter paradise, He says, and the pleasure of Allah is the greatest. It's greater, far greater than what they will obtain in paradise. The fact that your Creator is pleased with you. So this affair is very important. So we're going to allow the brother to read the, some of the ayat concerning this topic. صفة الرضا عاشد الفجر وقوله رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه and his saying Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him so this attribute we affirm it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed it for himself we affirm it from what is apparent of what is apparent of his meaning and we say it befits His Majesty, it befits Him in His loftiness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's different from His creation. We don't say like the people of innovation, that if Allah is pleased with something, that means He has an inclination towards that object or person. It's a form of weakness, they say. And this is not correct. The pleasure of Allah is different from the pleasure of which that's found within creation. So they come and they interpret it to be, they say, we don't say Allah is pleased, but we say Allah wants to bestow His blessing upon His servant. So whenever they find the, uh, the wording, Allahu, Allah is pleased, or Ridwanun ridwan min Allah, the pleasure from Allah. They say it means iradatu al in'am. Allah desiring to bestow his blessing upon the servant. So they come with what it implies and they don't affirm what is directly understood from it. The explicit meaning. And this is due to them resembling Allah in the first place to his creation. Once you resemble Allah to his creation, they try to run away from it. They said, okay, here we understand uh, a wrong meaning. So let's run away from this meaning. And what do they run into? Something far greater. Ta'atil, which we took at the beginning of the class, which is totally to negate the attribute in the first place. This is the principle. Whenever they can't comprehend something, they say, okay, let's run away from affirming it by negating it. This is the principles. So, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن It comes in Surah Al-Bayyina. Also in Surah Al-Tawbah. That Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with, with Him. So the pleasure of the Sahabas, if you ask them, it was mentioned here, that they're pleased with Allah. If you ask them, is this a figurative meaning? Does this have some, is it not taken from what's apparent? They tell you, no, for the Sahabas, we affirm it. But for Allah, we don't affirm it. They're mentioned along with one another in the same context. So it shows you that these people, they've under, they're understanding what Allah has revealed and other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Arabic language. Allah is pleased with them. Meaning the Sahabas. The Sahabas. an. So this affair of the, of the Sahabas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. This is, the scholars they mention, Allah mentions this for a number of benefits. To show that we should as well make dua for the Sahabas with this format. Radiyallahu anhu. For a person ask you, where do you get this term saying radiyallahu anhu for the Sahabas? 
Say we take from this ayah, radiyallahu anhu. And also, it's information that's being passed. It's not actual dua. Because Allah has informed that He is pleased with them. So for anyone other than the Sahabas, it's considered to be a dua. But for the Sahabas, it's considered to be information that we're passing on. Radiyallahu anhum. Allah is pleased with them. Allah is pleased with them. Radiyallahu anhum wa an. And this is relating to the believers in the time of the Prophet. Who, who were the believers in the time of the Prophet? None other than Sahabas. Wa kullam wa'adullahu husna. All of them, from the first of them to the end of them, Allah has promised them paradise. All of the Sahabas, Allah has promised them Jannah. So this is our belief that for us to obtain the pleasure of Allah, we have to be pleased with those who Allah is pleased with. This is what the scholars mention. They said, لِنَيْلْ رِضَ Allah." To attain the pleasure of Allah, you need to be pleased with those who Allah are pleased with. And from whom Allah is pleased with are the Sahaba. So, رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا So this uh, is a very important topic. And we have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, it varies from one person to another. And also relating to actions and objects, that Allah may be pleased with an action or an object, and also regarding people. So it's an attribute of Allah that's connected to His will. He becomes pleased when He wills, and He becomes displeased when He wills. Also this attribute is not only affirmed by the texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it's also affirmed by the intellect. And a person would ask, how is it affirmed by the, the sound intellect? We say that a person would know through common sense or with correct logic that by humanity, being some from humanity are grateful to their Creator. Some of them believe, and others reject, they belie the Creator. We would know through common sense that the two groups in the sight of the Creator are not equal. One is a group that Allah is pleased with, and one is not a group that Allah is displeased with. So this is, as some of the scholars have mentioned, that is also proven by sound intellect along with the text. Or else, how, is, how are they equal? One who disbelieves and one who believes. And one of the meanings of this ayah, رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ an. The Sahabas them being pleased, or the believers being pleased with Allah, is in the next life of their reward. According to the levels that they're given, each one is pleased. He, each one assumes that no one has been given a reward better than him. That's how the, each person is in Jannah. Even the visitation, Allah has made the, the visiting from those who are above to downwards. And there's no visitation from down, from down to upwards. Why is that? Because when one visits those who are above, he's going to desire more and reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it in a way that each one is content with what he has been given to the extent that he assumes that no one has been given a reward better than him. That's the reward in Jannah. So they're pleased with the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can repeat for us the definition of ikhlas? We always say, have ikhlas, brother. Be sincere. What is the meaning of ikhlas? Huh? Who remembers the meaning of ikhlas? Ibtigha maradati Allah wa talab al-jannah. 
to desire the pleasure of Allah through your deed and to seek by it His blessed abode, His paradise. This is ikhlas. This is the beautiful definition that Shaykh Muhammad bin Salih Uthaymin came with. So if a person asks you the meaning of ikhlas, tell him this meaning. You won't, you won't go wrong. Many of the ayats, it either mentions a deed following seeking the pleasure of Allah or seeking his paradise. So it's one of the two. And also we find that the Prophet wasallam sometimes he would make dua by the means of the pleasure of Allah. So for example, he would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bi ridak min sakhatik. He would say, Allahumma, O oh Allah, I seek refuge by your pleasure from your displeasure. So those who come interpret this attribute and say it doesn't mean pleasure. So what is the Prophet seeking refuge to? He said, Oh Allah, I seek refuge by your pleasure from your displeasure. So here we affirm this attribute according to what has come in the text. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows more, is more acquainted of himself than anyone else. This is the problem. If a person, one of us were to come and to speak yani about another person regarding himself and say, no, so-and-so is not like this. He doesn't look like that. Or he doesn't have this attribute. He's not strong. And that person himself says he's strong. Who are we going to believe? That person, we're going to say, بَلْ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا the human is more acquainted of himself than anyone else. So with greater preference, Rabbul Alameen, Allah, the sublime, is more acquainted of himself than anyone else who may be found of the creation. Tayyib, we're going to allow the brother to continue to read, inshallah. So, generally that for us to be, to obtain the pleasure of Allah, we need to be pleased with what Allah is pleased with. To be pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. And the more a person is Acquainted with the things that Allah is pleased with and increases of that, he increases of the pleasure of Allah. Whom darajatun inda Allah. There are different levels in the sight of Allah. So, we we'll allow the brother to read. Tawadun. Sifat al Madam was sahut, wal karahi wal bogh, ashrams of anger, displeasure, disapproval, and hatred. وقوله ومن يقض المؤمن متعمدا فجزاؤه جهنم فجزاؤه جهنم خالدا فيها وغضب الله عليه ولعنه and his saying whoever deliberately kills a believer then his recompense is hell to abide therein and Allah is angry with him and has cursed him <coughs> the next ayah that was recited that affirms for us another attribute of Allah that Allah gets angry. That Allah gets angry. وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا Whoever kills a believer intentionally, purposely, فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمْ His recompense is Jahannam. Jahannam from one of the names of the hellfire. Some said it was given that name due to the severe darkness that's found therein. Allah knows best. Khalidan <laughs> fiha. This word khalidan <laughs> fiha. That he'll be there for a long period of time. Because it comes in the Arabic language. Khalidan <laughs> fiha. That it can mean something that remains for a long period of time. Something that remains for a long period of time. Like they'll say mountains that are khalida. 
mountains that remain on the earth for a long period of time. So it doesn't mean that if a person kills a believer that he will never be admitted to paradise. But he's under this threat of being punished severely. And this ayah contains five severe punishments for the one who kills another Muslim. What about if a person kills a non-Muslim? Is there a severe threat as well? Yes. The Prophet wasallam mentioned that whoever kills a mu'ahad, a man that's under the covenant of the Muslims for to be protected, or a person that has the treaty to be under the law of peace, to be protected. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَمْ يَرِحْ رَائِحَةِ الْجَنَّةِ He will not smell the fragrance of paradise. This is the severe threat. As well, what about the hypocrite? person says, okay, the believer is not here, is mentioned, the non-Muslim, okay. So what about the hypocrites? As there's also a threat that comes regarding that affair. So the hypocrite comes in the narration. Let it not be said that Muhammad kills his companions. So they have the protection from that affair. And Allah becomes angry. So one of the punishments is that Allah becomes angry with him. And he curses him. So let's... Let's count how many uh, punishments in these are for the one who kills a, a Muslim. His retribution in, in the next life is that he'll be in hellfire. Khali dan fiha for a long period of time. Wa ghadib Allahu alayhi and Allah is, becomes angry with him. وَلَعْنَا And he is cursed. What's the meaning of cursed? Huh? When we say so-and-so is cursed, what does that mean? Huh? Baraka is taken away from the... Baraka, okay. They are removed from the, the mercy of Allah. So, they're expelled from the mercy of Allah. and Or they're expelled or distanced from the mercy of Allah Ta'ala. And this may differ from one person to another, how they're distanced and how they're expelled. So it's a severe affair. So who can repeat that? His first punishment is hellfire. As well, what that punishment was added, he's there for a long period of time. So to point that some of them understood from this ayah that he will, there's no toba for the one who kills a believer. Because it says, Khali dan fiha, he's there, they said, forever. So it was described to Ibn Abbas, but he recanted from that opinion. There's six opinions of the scholars on what's the meaning of this ayat. That it says, Khali dan fiha. And we, when we hear this word Khali dan, we usually recall eternity or forever. So some, mean, some said it means. As a threat, but the threat of Allah is always open for forgiveness. It's always open for forgiveness. So Allah can never break His promise, but He could break His threats. This is what they said. If Allah makes a threat in the Quran, He can break it. But if He makes a promise in the Quran, then He cannot break it. لا يخلف الله وعده he doesn't break his promises. But I can Allah Lahu and Yukhlif Wa'ida. He has the right to not to carry out a threat that he made. 
So out of mercy. So some have mentioned six opinions. In all cases, uh, it means khalidan, a for a long period of time. It doesn't mean forever. وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْ وَلَعْنَ So the worst of all those punishments is the last one, the curse of Allah. And the reason why it's so severe is that when you kill a, a believer, you have three rights, hukuk to face. The rights of Allah, and that is not dropped except if Allah forgives you. For killing a believer, the first right that you transgress is the right of Allah. So if Allah forgives you, there then is dropped. The second right is the right of the family. You transgress the right of the family. And that is only dropped if the family forgives you. They forgive you for killing their member of their family. The third one, the third right, the, the person transgresses by killing, is the right of the person himself, the one who was killed. And can that be dropped? No, it can never be dropped. Why? Because you have to face that person, Yom al Qiyamah. The person who killed, he has to meet the person who he killed in front of Allah, and he was ask Allah, Rabbi Salhu Fima Qatalini. Oh Allah, ask him, why did he kill me? This is a question that he has to answer to Allah in front of that person. So two can be forgiven. And one can be forgiven. He has to be brought in front of Allah in that affair. So the affair of murder is severe. So allow the brother to continue due to the shortness of time. ذلك بأنه اتبعوا ما أسخط الله وكرهوا رضوانه that is because they followed what displeased Allah and they hated his pleasure, his pleasure. <coughs> one more thing I forgot to mention was killing the believers are at different levels for example killing a prophet what's the ruling on killing a prophet? Killing a prophet, the scholars they say, is automatically disbelief. Meaning it's a form of rejecting the message of the prophet. And we mentioned that this ayah contains the affirmation of the attributes of Allah becoming angry. The groups that we mentioned earlier in different sessions they interpret this attribute from what it's apparent, from what's apparent, because they say if we affirm that Allah becomes angry, it means the linguistic meaning of angry, anger with humanity. They said anger with humanity means غَلَيَان الْقَلْبِ The heart or the blood boiling and emotions arising, and they said, God is yeah, and far from such an attribute. So said, firstly, we do not know the actuality of this anger. But we know it's not, it does not resemble the anger, of, the anger of the people. There's a difference between the creator and the creation. But we say he gets angry in a manner that befits his loftiness. He gets angry in a manner that befits his loftiness. The, the next ayah that was read, it was relating to the hypocrites that they pursued what this, uh, they, dis, they pursued what Allah detested, and what what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was pleased with, they of those who disliked it. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made their actions infutile, rejected, invalid. So, the, f- the first t- attribute that has been mentioned here
is the pleasure of Allah. The second one is the anger of Allah. If a person dislikes what Allah is pleased with, the origin of this is that is disbelief. For example, he says, I dislike this ruling of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. He says, I dislike the ruling of praying. Why do we have to pray? I'm displeased with this ruling. He said, here is disbelief. But what about a person, he doesn't dislike the ruling in itself, he dislikes somewhat comes about from it. Some of the athar. Some of the traces that may come about from what is practice of that ruling. For example, polygamy or different affairs. A woman, she says, I do not like polygamy or I do not like this or that. A person can't come and say uh, she fell into disbelief because she disliked what pleases Allah. So no. She is not saying she dislikes it due to itself that Allah ruled it and Allah is pleased with it. But she's saying she's disliking some of what may come about from the men, how they carry about in performing this act. So there's a difference. So the first thing is that it's incumbent that everyone is pleased with the legislation of Allah, what Allah ruled with. What about what Allah decreed? Do we have to be pleased with what Allah decreed? We say we have to be pleased with the decree of Allah. But we don't necessarily have to be pleased with what Allah decreed. See the difference? Who can tell us the difference? Huh? Related to the action of Allah, the decree, we're pleased with it because Allah does everything with a wisdom. Even creating Iblis, Allah created Iblis with a wisdom behind it, we're pleased with that. But the affairs that are decreed of sickness, poverty, of people going through calamities and so forth, a person has a choice to be yani, pleased with those affairs and to, or not to be pleased with it. And there's also affairs that is not allowed for you to be pleased with, from what Allah decreed. Like for example, the haram that's found on the earth. Are you allowed to say I'm pleased with that? Of stealing, robbery and so forth? La, we're not pleased with that. So there's a difference between say, us saying we're pleased with the decree of Allah and we're not necessarily pleased with what was decreed. So if we're, if we're speaking in relation to the action of Allah, then we're always pleased with it because it's done out of wisdom. But if we're speaking about the thing that was decreed or the affair that was decreed, then we look at it from that angle. It could be encouraged to be pleased with or it could be disencouraged. For example, the haram and so forth. And there's some lines of poetry they mention. وَلَيْسَ وَاجِبَ عَلِ الْعَبْدِ الرِّضَى بِكُلِّ مَقْضٍ وَلَكِنْ بِالْقَضَى There's no wajib upon the servant to be pleased with everything that was decreed. But what is wajib is to be pleased with the decree of Allah. And if a person reaches to a level where he's he's pleased with even what is decreed, when he's poor, his contentment and his pleasure is as if he is in a state of richness. Meaning, his heart, it doesn't bother him from inside. Shaykh Muhammad Salih al he says, he says he, he circulates or moves with the decree of Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for him hardship of difficulty, he's patient. And he knows that is better for him. 
And if it comes to him a decree of goodness, then he is grateful and he knows that is good for him. And he knows all of his affair is of, of goodness for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for him. So he accepts the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with full arms. With full arms. So this is a high level. If a person reaches to this level where he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for him that which is best. Or that he knows that the affairs have been written before he was even born. If he reaches this level where he submits to the decree of Allah, then this is from the highest levels of a sabiqeen bil khayrat. Those who strive to good deeds. Those who strive to good deeds. I have one more thing we want to mention before moving out to the last ayah. Some have said that the main definition for being pleased with uh, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for him to submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained and for him to have good thoughts with Allah and to be pleased with his rewards, the rewards of Allah, whether it be in this life or next Is there a difference between Ridha Billah wa Ridha Anillah? Huh? Being pleased well, regarding Allah and being pleased with Allah. Is there a difference between the two? I mean, one is being pleased with Allah as your Lord. I mean, pleased with his religion. So being pleased with is, is related to the affair of being pleased in itself with Allah and his religion and his prophet. But being pleased with regarding Allah is meaning being pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared as an abode for the good doers. So when you say Radhi to Billah, I'm pleased with Allah. That means in itself, Allah in his, in his essence, I'm pleased with him. And his religion and his prophet. When you say Radhi to Anillah, I'm pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed or what he has prepared of good deeds and so forth. So there's a slight difference. Ibn Qayyim, he gives a description of having pleasure with Allah or being pleased with Allah is, uh, is similar to having good character. Husnul khuluq with Allah. He says to have good yani, manners with Allah. It is means to be pleased with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by not objecting to Him in His kingdom. His kingdom and not to add excessive speech of complaints. When a person, he complains, you find people now, like he'll say, he, he won't say, Ma ila matr. He won't come and complain and say, why the people are so in need of water. Or today is extremely hot. He goes, وَلَا يَقُولْ هَذَا يَوْمْ شَدِيدُ الْحَرُّ شَدِيدُ الْبَرْدُ We do this a lot. He said when the servant is pleased with the decree of Allah, he doesn't complain. You don't find him always complaining. Today is extremely cold. There's a difference between informing the people of the weather or informing someone due to an occasion or reason. But just, you find he's complaining of just expressing his emotions. This is not good manners with Allah Taala, Or he says... Al-Faqru Bala, if he's going through poverty, he says poverty is, is a trial. Wal-Iyal Ham Wagam, 
Or if he has a lot of kids and he's going through ups and downs, he complains and he says, kids, children are a headache. And these likes of these words. وَلَا يُسَمْ شَيْئًا قَضَاهُ اللَّهُ وَقَدِرُهُ بِإِسْمْ مَذْمُومٍ He should never ever mention something that Allah has ordained in a bad manner. As just in a, in a, in a manner of complaint. This is Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah. So a speech that's not needed, you would uh, abstain or afraid from it. Tayyim Labas, now we're going to mention the last ayah and then we'll stop there. Rather, Allah displayed them being sent, so He held them back. Kabura Makatan عند الله أن تقولوا ما لا تفعلون Greatly detested in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. It's amazing, huh? There's a session on the rida of Allah, or books been written concerning the pleasure of Allah. What pleases Allah, and what how a person attains to being amongst those who Allah is pleased with. This is, should be our goal. For verily, rida nas ghayatun la tudrak. The pleasure of the people, they say it's a goal that's unachievable. To please everyone, that's a goal that a person will never achieve. So make your goal to please Allah. For verily, if you please Allah, then the righteous will become pleased with you. And if you displease Allah, then the people on the earth will sooner become displeased with you. It comes in a narration of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha from her own statement. that she said, مَنْ طَلَبَ رِضَ اللَّهِ فِي سَخْطِ النَّاسِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَأَرْضَاهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَكَمَا قَالُ كَمَا جَاءَ فِي الْأَثَرِ that whoever seeks the, the pleasure of Allah at the expense of the people becoming displeased, then Allah will become pleased with that person and will make the people pleased with him. Amazing. And whoever seeks the pleasure of the people at the expense of the pleasure of Allah, meaning he loses out the pleasure of Allah, then Allah will make the people displeased with him, and he himself, Allah, will be displeased with him. So let us make our goal to the pleasure to seek the pleasure of Allah. So the, the next attribute that was mentioned, فَلَمَّا آسَفُونَا تَقَمْنَا مِنْهُ When they angered us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, intaqamna minhum. And the word intiqam, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sought vengeance against them or retribution for what they did. And we say the anger of Allah indicates His justice. That when the people are doing actions, they're held accountable for their actions. They're held accountable for what they do of crimes and so forth, there's consequences for the actions. If in this world, the system of the people, they consider it to be a form of justice, that people be held accountable for their crimes, and people have to pay for their consequences, that's a form of justice, and that's praiseworthy. With greater preference, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى The system of Allah is that people, when they commit crimes, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has justice of retribution for their, for their actions. So there comes in some hadith, كريه الله, Allah dislikes. So we say Allah becomes angry, Allah dislikes, Allah detests, He hates. All of these wordings have been affirmed. From kariha, 
Abghad Allah. The next ayah was Kabura Maqatan Indallah and Takulu Mala Tafaloon. It was regarding the ayah that some people will say if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indicate to us the best of deeds so we can carry it out. And the deeds that have the best rewards. So when it comes and is revealed and explained to them, they don't carry it out. So, يَا يُلَذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ O you who believe, why do you say that which you don't do? It is a reason to earn the anger and the wrath of Allah. So, maqtan is like the wrath. It's a severe form of anger. It is the greatest form. If a person earns this type of wrath, this type of anger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's the greatest wrath. لَمَقْتُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ مَقْتِ مِنْ مَقْتِ أَنفُسِكُمْ إِتُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى الْإِيمَانِ فَتُكْفَرُونَ The ayah that the maqtu Allah is akbar. The wrath of Allah is greater than your own wrath. So a person always has to remember, the anger of Allah, is not nothing is really, can resemble it. So we're going to end uh, with a few side benefits and then we'll end there, inshallah. Side benefit is that regarding the anger of Allah, from the means, from the greatest means to avoid the wrath of Allah is to have hatred for what Allah has hatred for. If you have hatred for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hatred for, this is one of the greatest means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exempting you or protecting you from those who he becomes angry with. So this affair of love and hate in Islam is very important. Our religion revolves upon it. Love and hate. Nowadays we find we're weak in this affair. And wala and bara, love and hate in Islam. It's very important that you you love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and you make that apparent. And you have hatred for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hatred for and you make that apparent. The next side benefit is the the people of innovation, when they interpret the attribute of anger, what do they say? They said, Iradatu al intiqam. Allah intended vengeance upon the person. They give this long definition. Instead of just affirming the word, they come with a long definition just to avoid. And this is all based upon yani philosophy. طيب because it comes that it says here walana whoever kills a believer he earns the wrath of Allah and also he be cursed be cursed. Does this mean that he will never be opened for the forgiveness of Allah? Huh? It says he's cursed. A person kills a believer intentionally. Do we say he is cursed forever? Huh? No, we don't say that. Because the curse of Allah are at different levels. When Allah curses, the disbeliever is not as he curses Allah. Uh, a believer or a Muslim. So it can mean to be distanced somewhat or some way from the mercy of Allah and not entirety. 
So they said there's juz'i and there's kulli. There's partially and there's entirely. So alhamdulillah we have completed and we have took in these, these two attributes, the attributes that Allah becomes pleased and also the attributes that Allah becomes angry. We ask Allah wa ta'ala, to allow us of those who attain the pleasure, His pleasure and to protect us from His anger and His wrath. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I don't think there's any questions either. Huh? So, you know how um, in 12 believers, three rights are transgressed, so the third one was mentioned is that person, you'll, have, you'll get your right back on Yom Al-Qiyamah, but can that person forgive you on Yom Al-Qiyamah? Uh, they say uh, Yom Al-Qiyamah and uh, it comes in a hadith. فَلْيَتَحَلَّلَ الْعَبْدِ قَبْلَ يَأْتِي يَوْمْ لَا دِي نَارْ وَلَا دِرْحَمْ That a person he seeks pardoning in this life and to free himself from any burdening of hardship in this life, before the next life, because a person will be taken to face uh, retribution for his action on in front of Allah Taala, but the affair of being questioned, that is not to be pardoned. I mean, that he will say, ask this person why he killed me. But as for forgiveness on that, we say Allah knows best. But uh, the hadith says the man will come who was murdered. He will say, Ya Rabb, sell hada fi ma qatilani. Oh my Lord, ask this person why he killed me. And this is something that Allah has ordained to happen, to emphasize the severity of murder. So we end with this, inshallah. Huh? Uh, the... The correct opinion is that uh, killing the believers, who are, you know, besides the prophets, is not. Uh, it's, it's still a, a affair that's open for toba. So the meaning, it is not a affair of disbelief, and it's not a affair of uh, the person is under the will of Allah Taala. Ta and some of the scholars have said the, those who said that. There's no tawbah for him. It means that as it comes to the hadith, where a person kills or commits murder, yeah, and he, uh, as it comes to the wording, Ballah, the wording of the hadith of Ibn Umar, man, yani, araqa demman haraman ballah. The Prophet said, whoever spills yani, unlawful blood, then he, he gets cut off from the religion. So meaning that he eventually becomes so weak to the extent that perhaps he may even leave Islam. So we found uh, many people, their affair becomes so weak that they end up leaving Islam. So some have said that's the beating. But or else, yani, killing and murder is from the major sins. And it's not what takes a person out of the fold of Islam. And he's still under the will of Allah. He can be forgiven. And also if he repents to Allah, his sin will be accepted as repentance, inshallah. That is the fear of tawbah for a murderer. Tayyip, any other last questions? Can you uh, just repeat the, the visitation of the people of Jannah? Uh, a benefit from Shaykh Abdurrahman Ajlan, he says that in the next life in paradise, Allah has made the visitation, that, uh, people in the paradise, they visit one another. He said it, a ziyara min al-a'la lil-adna. Wa laysa ziyara lil-adna lil-a'la. Those who are at higher levels can visit those below them. And those below them can visit those who are higher than them. And all of this is to make sure that each one is content with what he has of ranks and levels. So each one assumes that he has not, he's been given, no one has been given similar term in reward. This is part of his reward. To feel special, huh?
Is there, a, is there a reason why this ayah was placed in between the ayat in the law ayah for the Yishra Kabi or the Fiqh of the Yishra Kabi as a like as a type of evidence that since um, Allah does not forgive Shirk and He forgives anything less than that, so this ayah can be used to say it's from the major sins? No, no, this ayah is anything beyond uh, Shirk. It's from the affairs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, open the forgiveness. So there's about six opinions. That the scholars have mentioned regarding this verse is a very complicated, complicated topic of explaining this verse. The scholars have a number of opinions, but at the end of it, we say the strongest of them. It means Khali dan fiha that he is in uh, hellfire for a long period of time. And the, one of the reasons why we know that a person who, f- who kills is open for toba is the ayah surah al furqan وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٌ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَى أَثَامًا يُضَاعِفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا إِلَّا مَنْ تَاب Except those who repent. So we understand from that that Tawbah is open يعني, regarding this affair. So we end with this, inshallah. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, wa shadu ala ilan ansa, astaghfiruka, wa tubu alayk. Barakallah fikum. There won't be no class upcoming, uh, this upcoming Wednesday, inshallah. Uh, inshallah, the brothers, excuse me, inshallah. Barakallah fikum.